Hey there, I'm the GDT guy, and you are on video five of a deep dive into a somewhat niche topic in the world of mechanical design, engineering drawings, and geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, aka GDT. Now, if you like what you hear, please like and subscribe to the video so you get the rest of them in your feed. And please also comment with your agreements and disagreements and help me identify any mistakes I've made. In the video descriptions, I will post a link to where you can find PDFs of all the drawings I discuss so you can pause and go and look at them yourself. Okay, let's go. This is a discussion about the use of dowel pins as locating features in machined parts and how we can apply tolerances to those features on engineering drawings. The past four videos have mostly been about parts like this gray one with pins pressed into them. But let's change gears for this video and talk about the other side of this interface, like this blue part, which has features which locate onto the pins. This is a very popular method for locating parts, and for good reason. I talked about a few of those in video one. The dimensioning and tolerancing for the parts with the pins pressed in is a little challenging. I've talked about it already, and there's still a lot more to come. By comparison, the drawing for this part with the hole in the slot is relatively straightforward. And this is GDTG00402. Actually, this works just splendidly with the GDT system. And it does for the same reason that we love this hole and slot method for locating parts. It constrains all six degrees of freedom in a super clean way. There's no ambiguity here. I see these four bolt holes, so I know all the force in the assembly is coming in the direction of these hole axes. I see the hole and the slot on this side. So I know this is the interface surface, my primary datum feature. When I add this part to the assembly, this surface is going to constrain the part in three degrees of freedom. That'll be two rotations, call them pitch and roll, and one translation, up and down. Maybe call that Y. The function of this hole will be to constrain two more degrees of freedom, the in-plane X and Z translation. And all that's left for the slot is the in-plane yaw rotation. And it's important in this case that this is a slot and not just another hole. That's because we're going to try for a really close fit. And if it were two holes, any variation in the distance between the pins or the distance between the holes would cause this assembly to not go together. We would call that over constrained. It's like reaching to constrain three plus two plus another two, like seven degrees of freedom. But with the slot in there, it's a perfect three, two, one, primary, secondary, tertiary. So let's go to the drawing and look how well this works with the Y14.5 system of datum reference frames. We're looking at drawing GDTG00402, which depicts a nice, simple aluminum part. Obviously, this part is kind of pointless, right? It just screws down and does nothing but take up space. Any part you actually design like this it's going to have more going on, like up here probably, but we're just going to stay focused on this interface. I gave the primary datum feature a 2000s flatness and even a 32 micro inch surface roughness. Roughness is not flatness, okay? But in this case, I just want to do a little bit better than my block tolerance 63 micro inches, which seems a little rough. So this will be a high quality surface achieved by face milling, fly cutting, maybe even lapping. I call that the datum A feature, and this is a little strange, but in note two, I specify that all adjacent edges are to be machine chamfered. You don't need to do that in all your parts. I just thought it'd be right for this one. Let's have a look at my secondary datum feature call out. I like this way of dimensioning the upper and lower limit for a feature like this because it doesn't express any preference for a nominal size. I believe I modeled it at 251 though, the, the MMC as a nod to the machinist. So if we take the 251 MMC minus zero perpendicularity at MMC, we get a virtual condition of 0.251. Now maybe you say, I'm uncomfortable with zero perpendicularity. I want to put five tenths. Okay, but since it's the virtual condition that we're after, now you have to change that MMC lower limit to 0.2515 so you can get back to 251 virtual condition. And then to maintain the one and a half thousand size limit, you'd want to increase the LMC size to 0.253. This would result in more clearance on the pin than maybe we're hoping for. 
There's more to say here, but you should get comfortable with this zero at MMC. All it is saying is that if the hole is made at its absolute smallest, it cannot also have perpendicularity deviation. Think about this. Under the Y14.5 rule number one, all day long, with nearly every dimension, we are saying perfect form at maximum material condition. This is a simple call out that says perfect orientation at maximum material condition. So how did I come up with these numbers? Our first job is to ensure that we fit over the pin, which is all about virtual condition, which we said is 251, the same as the lower size limit. Easy. But now let's skip ahead a minute to the drawing for the mating part in this assembly, GDTG00401. This one has quarter inch MS16555 dowel pins with an MMC of 0 0.2503 in diameter. In addition to that, they have a 4 tenths perpendicularity to their primary datum. So we're up to 0 0.2503 plus 4 tenths for a 0 0.2507 virtual condition. So virtual condition 0 0.2507 for the pin, 0 0.2510 for the hole. So worst case scenario, we still have three tenths of clearance. So how about this upper limit for the size of the hole? To be honest, I just picked 0.2525 because it gives me one and a half thousandths of machining tolerance, which I judge to be somewhat reasonable. But what this number up here is going to do is control the amount of allowance in the joint. So our worst case scenario, allowance wise, is the largest, most perpendicular hole going over the smallest, most perpendicular pin. The largest, most perpendicular hole is 0.2525 minus the smallest, most perpendicular pin at 0 0.2501. So we have 2.4 thousandths of possible allowance. 2.4 thousandths, that's about the thickness of a piece of paper or a human hair. Pretty good. But if you need better than that, the only way to do it is to adjust these numbers and to tighten tolerances. And all I ask, now that I've shown you the light, is that you don't lie to yourself about all the factors that go into this fit and what your manufacturing methods can accomplish reliably. This hole is 300 deep and flat bottom. The only way I see to make it is to very carefully, circularly interpolate it with an end mill. That's why I like that one and a half thousandths of tolerance between the lower and upper limit. You might be asking, can't I pilot drill and ream a hole to better size precision? And you'd be right. But what does that really buy you? You still have to mill this slot. The reamer can't help you there. And here's where we get into some of the strange characteristics and even fictions of this interface. The XYZ origin of this part is here, where the axis of this hole meets data A. That's probably not how we're thinking about this part, which is otherwise symmetric about the center plane. I just chose these pin locations so they'd be far apart and do a good job controlling the orientation. Heck, even the choice to put the hole on this pin and the slot on this pin was a flip of the coin. So if the hole is extra close fitting and the slot is looser, is there really a great repeatability benefit for a part like this? I'm skeptical. I really like the idea of milling the slot and the hole in the same setup with the same tool probably without even raising the spindle. Back in the day, I would have used a smaller end mill like 3 16 or 5 30 seconds and start by milling these undersides, aiming for like 240. I would check them with gauge pins to see how close I came to that 240. I'd make some adjustments and I'd sneak up on the 251 through a series of very light cuts. It would be a little bit easier after the first part, but I'm sure I would still check every single part before the finish cut on that hole and the slot. As simple as this part looks, it would not take much to scrap it. Let's go and look at the callouts for this slot. I give the basic distance from datum B to the middle of the slot here, and I give the end-to-end -end length of the slot. End-to-end -end is the way to go here, and not the center of these arcs to each other. Center-to-center -center would be pretty abstract and difficult to measure. With end to end, I feel like all I really need is calipers. I think we should definitely not give the lengths of the flats because that would be extremely difficult to know where the flats end and where the arcs begin. 
Now you know and I know that the arcs of the slot are likely to be produced in the same operation as the flats and are likely to have the same accuracy. Still, the length of this slot is not a precise feature, so I give it a relatively loose tolerance, a slam dunk if they get the flats right. And then I give a position, which is perfect position at MMC when the slot is at its shortest length, but it gets looser if the slot is longer. Because there's a pretty large size limit on the slot length, I also call this a slam dunk. If the CNC programmer is worried, they can change their program to make the slot a little bit longer nominally. Okay, now let's have a look at the callout for the slot width. I have my limit dimension size tolerance, which is the same as for the datum B hole, except there's no diameter symbol. And now let's have a look at the feature control frames. This top one gives a position to datum reference frame A primary, B secondary. I seem to remember in the past using zero at MMC here, but I got away from that. What this tolerance is controlling is the extent to which the slot is oriented so it's pointing toward the locating hole. The parallel plane's position tolerance implies that this is measuring the shift of the slot from side to side, but the effect of that is really an angular deviation of the slot. And where this would come into play is if you can imagine the pins being a little farther apart or closer together from the nominal, they're going to pick up on this slot a little different place along its length, which could rotate the part a little. This is a secondary effect, but I want to minimize it, which makes the zero tolerance tempting. But since our size limit is so small, I feel like I need to provide a little more tolerance. So I gave this the six thousandths. I want to show you a gauge I made to show you what this would look like. But first, let's note that the virtual condition here is 251 minus six, so 245. OK, so here's my idea for the gauge, real or imagined. And just a reminder about the gauges. I make them purple so you can tell when you're looking at one. And the idea with these is that they are extremely geometrically accurate. For our purposes, perfect. So this one has a datum A simulator, the flat surface. The datum B simulator is 251 diameter, the virtual condition of the datum B feature. And then back here, I have this rectangular piece to pick up the slot flats. Now, since this is a gauge, these flats are really very precisely oriented toward the datum B simulator, okay? And this rectangular feature here is 245 wide, the VC for this callout. So as you've probably guessed, any manufactured part would have to be able to fit down over these features all the way down to the datum A simulator. All right, so that's a way to think about this callout here, the position. What do you think? Do you agree with that? Next, you'll see that I call out perfect perpendicularity at MMC for the slot walls. Actually, I just had to change it to MMC. I had it wrong before. This is really similar to what we did with the datum B hole. And then I call this the datum C feature. And then one last thing on this slot. This is this 2XR call out. I know this one drives people crazy, so I want to explain it. You just got to think about this one. What happens if we put a dimension on the radii? Well, Fundamental rule number one is that every dimension must have tolerance. But we already have a tolerance on the width of the slot, which is what's really important to us. It is hard to measure a radius, especially a small one. And do we really care what the radius measures? If you think about it, it really can't be less than half of the slot width. And on the other end, what if it was infinity? Isn't that just a straight line? So the slot would be rectangular? Rectangular slot. Well, Functionally, whatever, it's fine. Practically, it seems almost inconceivable that it would be machined that way. So we just say R. It is a radius. Don't even measure it. The other option, I guess, is a reference dimension, but that's not very helpful. Everyone knows how to take this slot width and divide by two. So I have identified these three datum features, but to bring this to life as a datum reference frame, I need to see them referenced in another callout somewhere. That's what I have here on this whole callout and in a few other places. For these holes, the datum reference frame is A primary, B secondary, C tertiary. And I have another gauge to simulate this datum reference frame. The datum A and the datum B simulators are very similar to the last gauge I showed you. But now we also have a datum C simulator. This one is made at the 251 thousandths virtual condition of the slot. 
and it gets a little weird, but I think I have to let this datum C simulator be free to rotate a little. Maybe you can see that these datum B and datum C simulators would also work to verify that perfect perpendicularity at MMC for the hole and the slot. But that's just a bonus on top of their main function, which is to locate the blue part for inspection. We can start thinking about a Cartesian system with its 0, 0, 0 origin, right where the datum B axis intersects the datum A plane and oriented to the datum C center plane. And I can add more elements to this gauge, like these four holes, which I will use to inspect the position of the bolt holes. We'll get to all that before you know it. Please like and subscribe. GD&T guys, signing out. <laughs>